This reading is in Acts, it's chapter 26, verses 8 through 13. Okay. It says, Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. Thank you, Tim. You guys sound great today. It's always good to be able to praise God, and uh, it's always good to be with the people who are excited about God. Good job today, Justin. I appreciate you. I'm excited about our singing and uh, all the things that are going to be going on. We're working on a song called Oceans, and when we bring that in here, that's going to be fantastic. So something to look forward to. Lots of good things going on Wednesday, lots of good things that are happening around here. So I hope you'll be involved and just get to know some of the people that are here. It's a great, great time. Uh, And if you're coming for dinner on Wednesday, chicken fajitas. This is no bologna sandwich, all right? Just just saying, you know, kind of gets you ready for that. That's going to be a great thing. Uh, we want to talk a little bit today about being open to Jesus and what that really means for being open to Jesus. And that may seem like an obvious thing. I mean, who wouldn't be open to Jesus, right? In this day and time, I mean, people hold up John 3.16 banners. God so loved the world, he sent Jesus. I mean... It's perfect. Jesus is love. Jesus is joy. Jesus is peace. Who wouldn't be open to Jesus? I mean, Jesus is the guy who forgives, right? So if you've ever done anything wrong, then it's forgiven. We're all open to Jesus, aren't we? Isn't that the way it works? Well, let's talk about that a little bit, because apparently the passage that Tim read to us, and I'm not going to blame Tim for what Paul did, Tim's just the reader. He didn't actually do all of this. But he's describing a guy named Paul who comes in and who persecutes the church. That's not really being open to Jesus, is it? I mean, he's breathing threats and murder against the church. He's persecuting them. He's got letters to throw them in prison. He's got all kinds of things that are against Jesus. And they're not going to be what Jesus wants at all. In fact, what you see is a guy full of anger, a guy who is very much angry about the things that are going on with Jesus because they conflict with his ideas and with what he believes ought to be happening. And he doesn't believe Jesus is Messiah. They're getting in the way of his law. He's had this tradition for a long time, and so he really is out to destroy them. And so being open to Jesus may not be everything that we think. You, the, to continue the story that Tim was reading, uh, start with me in verse 13. He says, At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard the voice saying to me in a Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things which you have seen me and to those which in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified with me. Paul wasn't open to Jesus at all. He's describing what had happened to him earlier as he stands before Agrippa and 
Festus, and he's trying to talk about, I was an angry person. I did not like Jesus at all. I was against Jesus. They were distorting this law that we had, and they were claiming Jesus was, was Messiah, and he did not believe that in any way, and that he had openly persecuted the church. He had put Christians in, in prison. He had done everything he could. And then a light appeared. It's funny how you can have all of your opinions until you actually encounter Jesus. And I think that's what happens to us today is we think everything's perfect and wonderful because we've never really run into Jesus before. And we've never really seen who he is. And every single one of the people with him fall to the ground and his statement is... Who are you, Lord? And Jesus comes back with, I'm Jesus. I'm the one you're persecuting. Oops. I mean, that ought to be in the text, right? Somewhere in there, uh, okay. And I have come to, and he describes the service that Paul is going to give to appoint you and to send you to all of these people, but I'm going to rescue from both Jews and Gentiles, but I'm sending you as a light so that they might turn from Satan to God, so that they might see this kingdom of light, so that they might be able to understand who I am, so that they're going to be able to see me. And Paul, you're going to be the one who is able to do this. He calls him Lord. He recognizes his greatness. Is he open to Jesus? Well, I think he's getting there. He's beginning to get the idea of what it really means to be open to Jesus. And Jesus gives him a mission and a message to be able to go and present that people might receive forgiveness of sins and have a place with Jesus. And so he gives him commandment to tell others about Jesus. It's all open to Jesus. Well, he writes, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. To me, that says, yeah, I decided I would be open to Jesus because after all, when he's appeared to you like that, it's pretty clear that we are not on the same page and he's giving me a chance for me to be open or the door's closed. And so Paul decides he will be open to Jesus. And he goes and he's three days blind in Damascus. And Ananias comes to him and and he takes the scales off of his eyes so that he's able to see. He gives him the Holy Spirit as he repents and is baptized into Christ. And then Paul immediately starts preaching. He starts explaining about who Jesus is because he already knew all the answers from his study uh, that Jesus could not possibly be Messiah until all of a sudden he, all those scriptures that he knows turns against him. And all the proof that he had stacked up and tried to get as far as Jesus not being Messiah, all of a sudden he realizes Jesus fulfills every single one of those things. And he began to teach. And as he taught, many people believed. And many people came to Jesus. And of course, then persecution comes. And that's one of the things that happens. We realize what Jesus does. Jesus comes and he calls disciples, right? Not only with Paul, I mean, that's an amazing thing for that to happen. But most of the time, he just calls disciples in there to listen to the teaching that he has and perhaps see a miracle that he has if you live during the time of Jesus and then understand that he really meant for you to be his disciple, to follow him. Because there are so many examples. He's got 12 guys. Then how did they get to be the 12? Jesus came and he said, follow me. Okay, So how would we be open to Jesus? Well, the clue is follow him, right? It worked for 12. It worked for a whole lot more. That's really what he's trying to describe as we need to be able to 
be followers of Jesus? What if we're resistant in our relationship to him? Well, do you want a bright light or not? <laughs> I mean, he can give you that choice, or it's up to you to believe. And many people saw, and many people were healed, and they saw the compassion of God, and they saw the kindness of God being played out as Jesus went to those people who were poor and those people who were less advantaged. And he was able to take them and heal them and bring them back and take them out of their shame, as we talked about last week, and give this, them this kind of purpose in life so that they were no longer defined by the shame that they had. Now they could be defined by the glory of God and what God did in their life. They needed to be open to Jesus, but we see a lot of people were not because Jesus claimed to be Savior. Were they open to him as Savior? Nathaniel decided that absolutely not. He doesn't come from Bethlehem. He comes from Nazareth. Who's going to believe him? Pharisees decided they weren't open because he didn't endorse them and he didn't follow the law the same way that they did. We don't believe in him. And there are so many others that just seem to have rejected Jesus as well. You know, he's that crazy guy who's out there talking all kinds of stuff, but we, we really understand what the law says and we're going to keep this law and we're going to follow this law. You see, open to Jesus means you're open to the way that he lived. You're open to the things that he said. You're open to what he said about those things. Open is where it all begins. And I have three stories. The first one we've already looked at, I want to describe to you about how that, what that means to be open to Jesus. Saul certainly was not open at the beginning. Neither were some of these people. And some of them decided that they would be open to Jesus. I've got two more stories I want to tell you about what that really means. The first one talks about evil. Is evil open to Jesus? Have you ever known somebody who's really evil? I hope not, but chances are if you've been alive for very long, you've run into some people who are pretty close. I mean, they may be right on that edge of saying, I think this guy is pure evil. Well, Jesus ran into a guy who was absolutely possessed by it. And that's what you see happening in Mark chapter 5. It says, and they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes, and when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. And he lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces, and no one had strength to subdue him. And night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and he fell down before him, crying out with a loud voice. He said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. That's a scary passage, isn't it? Have you met that guy before? Maybe somebody who's his cousin who seems like, you know, he's just crazy enough to do anything. Anything that would be against God, anything that would destroy. And this guy can't even live in town. They've tried to, you know, tie him up because that's what we do with people who aren't like us, right? We tie him up and we put him in chains and we, you can't even do that. He's too strong. He breaks all the chains. There are so many demons alive in him. Ashby will explain all of that on Wednesday night. So come and listen to Ashby as he explains how this all happens. But how in the world is he going to deal with all of this? And what does it mean? Is he open to Jesus? I don't think so. Except the only way to subdue him is... Jesus, because he comes and he falls down in front of Jesus. And I don't know that I'd say he's open to Jesus. His only thing is, please don't torment me. Well, maybe that would work for us, right? As we stand at the judgment seat, please don't send me to torment. Is that going to be close enough? No. 
that he doesn't say to the demons, okay, you guys seem like good demons. I'm going to just let you go this time since you asked me so nicely, and you came, and you bowed, and not at all. And then there's the whole story about the pigs and about how they asked to go into the pigs, and sure enough, he lets them go into the pigs, and the pigs all run down and are drowned in the sea, so you've got like 2,000 dead pigs floating in the sea. And there were people there who were... I don't know. They're not shepherds. Shepherds are with sheep. What are, what's with pigs? Pig herders? Can you shepherd pigs? I'm not sure. Anyway, the people who were there watching over the pigs are there, and they're so amazed at all of this because of what Jesus does with the man. And they go back and they, they get their friends in the city and go, you know what, we don't have a job anymore. Because after all, there's nothing out there to shepherd. It's all in the sea. And we're done. And people are amazed at this, and so they come out. And it's amazing to watch this. This has been such a tormenting time for this guy. He's helpless, he's powerless, and yet he's controlled by this evil. Now, I would suggest to you maybe that's what happens to people today is that inside the way they are, but they're so controlled by the habits and so controlled by the things that evil would bring that the force of evil in their life is just too much. Jesus has been asking demons to come out of them, and it takes a bit. There's negotiating. And finally, they do. It says in verse 16, And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. And when he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him. Because he said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how much he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. That's such an amazing story. They come back and they see the man clothed and sitting. I don't know that he'd ever been clothed and sitting in years and years and in his right mind. And sitting with Jesus. And they have the opportunity to be open to Jesus because after all, what a huge thing has happened. A guy who is literally possessed by evil itself. And they have the opportunity to say, then you could take care of my sin. Then you could take away any habit, any evil I have, any control that, that Satan might have over me. And they don't. Because they are not open to Jesus. And they ask him to leave. We would rather have our evil world and the crazy guy that we know about than to lose 2,000 pigs. And a lot of times, our world will decide those kind of decisions based on economic terms. Whatever is the best economically, let's go with that. We don't want religion to get in the way of, of what? Our welfare? Our profit margin? And, and yet, that's what they do. They ask him to leave. Jesus says that's not being open. And you know what Jesus does? He leaves. When we are not open, he does not open us. He lets us not be open. And he is ready to leave. He's getting in the boat. And the man said, I don't want to stay here with these people. And so he asked, I want to go with you. And Jesus says, no. 
Jesus, I thought you would be open to the man. After all, at least with all this trouble, wouldn't you be open to the man when he gives you this kind of request? Don't leave me here with all these people who now hate me because I've ruined everything for them. And that's not what happens, is it? Jesus says, I want you to return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. Because that is being open to Jesus. It is that we've got a story to tell. It is that something has happened to us. And we have a story to tell. That's exactly what happened with Paul, right? I mean, he didn't come to this great thing with this great light and say, okay, here you are, and, and now I will forgive you, and, and I'm going to bless you, and now you can sit down and not have to do anything. He says, no, no. <laughs> I've got a lot of places where you need to go talk about me. I'm going to send you to Jews. I'm going to send you to Gentiles. I'm going to send you all over the world, Paul. Because you've got a story. When you are open to Jesus, you've got a story. And this guy has got a story, doesn't he? Man. And he goes back and he begins to declare how much people have done for him. And everyone marvels. I like that. They've probably already heard the gossip. But when he tells the story about how much God has done for him, Everyone marvels at a story that is not a story of economics, but a story of the power of God. Everyone marvels at that. He had a mission. He had a message to share, and he surrenders to Jesus. He is doing what Jesus wants. That's what it means to be open to Jesus, is to realize that that's what makes us important. And you realize how many people turn Jesus down? I mean, it's rather incredible, this maybe half and half as you read through the New Testament. Certainly there are a lot of conversion stories, but we also run into a lot of other people, don't we? The rich young ruler? No. I mean, it is a little bit extreme, right? He says, well, what do I have to do to be open to you? And he says, well, for you it's a little bit exceptional because, once again, economics is getting in your way, so... Sell what you have and follow me. And he says, I can't do that. Or there's the disciple who wanted to bury his father. And he says, you can't wait. You need to either decide, come with me or not. And he seems to turn Jesus down because of that. We're left with that conclusion. Or the guy where he simply says, you know what? I don't know where I'm going to be next. Birds of the air have nests but i don't have any security and we're left with the impression that he says well i'm i I need a better organized ministry than that or the one who says i just want to say goodbye to the people at home and he's thinking more about the people at home than he is being open to jesus and jesus says i don't need that you either decide to go with me or not hand to the plow Because there are these expectations. Jesus is not open to unrepentant sinners. He is not open to the rebellious who refuse to listen to him. He is not open to hypocrisy of saying one thing and doing another. There's a story of Simon and a woman. Simon seems perfectly fine. I've got all these things, Jesus, and I can provide lunch. By the way, ignore the crazy lady that seems to be washing your feet. And Jesus says, no, Simon, you don't understand. You are not open to me. She is. Open to Jesus means following him. He first comes, and that's what he says to us. And Jesus is here to heal. He is here to help. And we see that in so many different passages that we see. Perhaps one that gets to me the most is the time when he's coming and Jairus meets him. He's a synagogue official and he runs out and he says, my daughter's at the point of death. And I, I need you to come and lay your hands on her and heal her so that she can be healed. 
And Jesus says, okay. But then there's this interruption that comes in the middle of the whole story as he's, as he's going, right? This lady comes up and it's like, come on, Jesus, come on, Jesus, can't you hurry? You ever been there where somebody gets interrupted? And they start a whole different conversation. And it seems like my little girl's life is hanging in the balance. Come on, Jesus, can't you hurry up? Well, it's that story that's so intriguing to me. Look in Mark chapter 5 and verse 25. It says, there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians who had spent all that she... She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. And she had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garment, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman knowing what had happened to her came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. She thought she could just, you know, get away with. She has such incredible faith. I don't know that anyone has ever done this. If you do the order of the stories, it doesn't seem to have ever happened before. It seems like she's the first one and nothing has ever worked in her life. Not a single cure from a single doctor. But she's heard about Jesus. She believes in Jesus. She thinks he could do something. But always before, it's come and touch. That's what Jairus said, right? Why didn't he say, just, well, would you just heal my daughter? Like the centurion. He doesn't. It's come and touch. And she comes believing, if I touch him, I could be healed. This lady has great faith. What a tremendous thing that is, that she has this kind of great faith. And not only that, but it works, right? That's really incredible. She comes up and it just takes one touch. And she's completely healed. And no one would know. She's just been on her period for 12 years. I mean, that's bad. I'm a guy and I don't even know what... I know what it's like to live with somebody on their period, but you know, it's got to be horrible, just what the rest of us have to put up with. But, I mean, you, I just can't even imagine something like that. And then Jesus turns around, and he says, Who touched me? Jesus, you're on a mission. Don't you understand this is important? There's a little girl whose life is hanging in the balance. And if I were Jairus, I would say, it doesn't matter. Come on, let's go. But no, Jesus stops dead. And with this crowd all around him, who touched me? And the disciples are saying, who touched you? Are you kidding me? We've all been touching you because we're all trying to hurry to get to this little girl. Why would he stop when he's got a little girl's life hanging in the balance? One, because he knows he can heal a little girl, even if she's dead. So there's not a huge rush for him. It just makes the miracle better, right? And it actually happens that way. The second thing is he does not let her get by with this, which teaches us something, I think, very important about being open to Jesus. Nobody could see the blood. Nobody could see her pain. Nobody could see what she had been through. She's anonymous. And if I could just touch God and get healed anonymously, wouldn't that be great? 
and I suspect there are many of us like that today who want to sneak in, sit in the back row, not really aiming at you people in the back row. It's just a figure of speech, you understand. You happen to sit there today, so sorry, I'm not making you the target, but just that we don't really want to be involved. We don't want anyone to know about us. We would like to be anonymous. We don't want to be seen, and we would like to be able to pray and for God to do something amazing and wonderful in our life that he would heal us and change us completely and these huge blessings would come because after all, it's why we came here. We want to be open to Jesus. It's why we showed up in the first place is so that we could be open and anonymous. And Jesus says, I don't do that. Really? Why not? For all of us introverted people, it would be really nice, wouldn't it? If we could just be anonymous about this and get his healing and get his forgiveness and not have to tell anybody. And he says, that's not being open to me. Oh, I don't like that part. She comes and touches and he says, I want you to tell me the story. In front of everybody, in front of this whole crowd, and he's already stopped everything, and he's called her out right in the middle of all of this. And I'm just imagining she's an introvert like a lot of us are because of how she acts. It isn't that Jesus wouldn't stop for her. It's that, well, I just want to touch him and let him go. He says, you can touch me all you want, and I will heal everything you've got, and you're going to tell everybody about it. And she comes trembling, scared. It may be one of those shame issues. You realize all of these are shame issues, don't you? Can you imagine a guy who has to admit, yeah, I killed half the church before I became a Christian, I mean. I mean, that's worse than almost anything anybody else here has to admit before they became a Christian. I killed so many people. I put them in prison. I did all these things that were terrible to them. That's a shame issue, but not for Paul. He says, yep, I did it. And I'm guilty, and Jesus took it away. And it is no longer a shame issue. Can you imagine the demon-possessed guy? He's got a story to tell. I have not worn clothes in 10 years. Everybody in town has seen me naked, and I've been running, because when they tried to capture me, guess what? They tried to make me civilized, and nothing could make me civilized except Jesus Christ. And when he comes into that, He's got a story to tell. It could be a shame story. It is not. He goes and declares how much God has done for him. What an incredible thing. And this lady who thinks she could be anonymous, not going to let it. I want you to tell your story also. And so she tells about the disease that she's had and how she's tried and all the different things and how one touch with Jesus and he was open and now she is open. I find that incredible. So when Jesus asks, who touched me today? What are you going to answer? I hope nobody knows, but are we going to be able to stand up and say, I did. And there's something that happened today in my life that has changed it. And I don't want to be the way that I have been before. And I want Jesus to make a difference in my life. And I want him, and I'm not going to be anonymous about it. I want to say something to somebody. Because shame is where we hide. And when Jesus touches us, we need to be able to tell the story. I 
was touched and I am open to Jesus and I have a story to tell. And it's so hard for us introverts to admit that. Being open to Jesus is being able to tell your story of what he's done for you. We cannot go unnoticed. We cannot be anonymous. Open to Jesus means doing what he wanted. It means open to everything that Jesus has done for you. So that's the question. What has Jesus done for you today? And the next one's harder. Do you want to tell us about it? Because that's the invitation today. Do you want to come tell us about it? Shall we stand and sing?